Wow, that was my first comment. Thank you, Kit. This was so interesting. Um, um, so the, ver the, the your very last observation about two kinds of referential chains, I just wish you would say a bit more about that. You said that you're going to have referential chains, J, 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 all bold, where J refers to J, and you'll also have ones where each J-I refers to a J-I plus, plus one. Are those the only possibilities, or could you have, like, staggered? OK. Yeah. Uh, the, sorry, those the, aren't by any means the only possibility. Yeah. So uh, we, we could have, for example, if, it's, if we started off with the proto-referential chain, Jack, Jill, Jack, Jill, Jack, yeah, Jill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Then we'd have Jack, semanticized Jack. And then the idea is that that proto-referential chain is realized, uniquely realized. Let's look at the, so now we have bold Jack and bold Jill. Um, and now this would be a case where bold Jack refers to bold Jill and bold Jill refers to bold Jack. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, what you have are either cycles, which could be of any length, like, like Jack and Jill, or you have these in infinite descending chains. So basically, th those are the only, um, where, where the, the elements are distinct. So basically, the, and there, there are other possible, sorry, that's not true, because I could also have uh, Jill referring to self-referential Jack. So this would correspond to Jill, Jack, 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 Jack. Okay, so <laughs> I could use Jill to refer to self-referential Jack. Uh, um, or, of course, I want to be fair, Jack referring to self-referential Jill. <laughs> so is this the case that the first case is the only one, the JJJ is, uh, is the only Thing you can obtain except by multiplying bare names as the as the basis is, is that right? In other words, the only the the way in which you get the non-identity patterns, like of which your second is an example, uh, is by putting similar patterns in the in the bare names. Uh, uh, yeah. So actually, this this raises a very interesting question. There's a this might be disputed because um, look. And I think maybe you're getting at this. I just said you can refer to, I can use Jill to refer to self-referential Jack, uh, where Jill is distinct from self-referential Jack. Now, can I not use Jack <laughs> to refer to self-referential Jack, where that Jack isn't the same as the self-referential Jack? And this theory says, no, you can't. Um, and um, there's a, a variant of this theory that says, but you can do that. You can, just as I can refer from above, so to speak, to self-referential Jack by means of Jill, I can refer from above and use Jack to refer to self-referential uh, uh, self Jack. And that gives you a different theory. And that's a theory in which um, the identity postulate, even, even the original identity postulate uh, fails because take the jack from above, and the, which refers to self-referential jack and, and the, and the self-referential jack, they refer to the same thing, which is self-referential jack, and they have the same basis. So this theory, which is a very natural theory, is in violation of this identity <laughs> principle. <laughs> so anyway, I was trying to give the simplest theory I could, but there's something to be said for having this other theory. I, I think maybe you were, I don't know if you're moving towards that uh, thought. Yeah, like, I was uh, thinking the whole thing was much too simple. And, and <laughs> I was just trying to make it more realistic. No, that's fantastic. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Kit. So, Paul, please come at the... Okay. Hi, Kit. Um, I'm hi. Paul, I'm Polly Gray. Nice. Oh, hi. Good, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, so c can, you, can you go back to the definitional route to self-reference to sort yeah. of step three? Uh, 
So for some reason, I, <laughs> I got stuck already there. Uh, <laughs> uh, it should be... Um, so <clears throat> let, let me try to go through the steps one, two, and three more, um, yeah. one by one. So, so, oh, yeah, good. I, found, I just found my bit behind that. Yeah, good. Let, let, yeah. Let, let's say that Jack, by definition, is the sequence J-A-C-K, right? Uh, well, uh, there's a question of how these quotation marks are functioning. Um, uh, in a way, you're begging certain questions against the semanticist if you interpret that quotation mark expression in terms of concatenation. Oh. Because, because that, then the, the, the hope of semanticizing this definition is lost. So the, the point, this is maybe where you're getting lost. In semanticizing this definition, we take quotation marks very seriously as de linguistic devices in their own right. This is part of my point to talk about ostensive meaning. So the use of quotation here is playing an essential role. So if you simply replace quote Jack by the concatenation of J, blah, 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 you'd be done for. The semanticization of this definition would be impossible. Hmm. Is that probably what, that's probably that's where you're getting held up, is that right? Right, yeah, I think so. But, yeah, I was, I was yeah, I think I was, I was at least under the interpretation I was suggesting I could get the transition from one to two. Um, so two now, you would read like, so Jack really is the name Jack, right? Is the that's yeah? If, if you interpret the quotes as in, in terms of concatenation, uh, this um, um, uh, sorry, there's there's a question as to um, I'm, I'm thinking of this on the. Uh, uh, Formal conception. Are we thinking of this in, the, in terms of the formal conception of language, or, 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 or sorry, maybe just thinking of it apart, quite apart from any conception? Yeah, yeah. Of because the, the, what I was not seeing is when we go to three, why doesn't the problem pop up again? Of what re, of, of what ensures the success of, of, of three? Actually, that uh, well, three is just the principle of semantic ascent, namely it's a general principle that says that if S equals T, from that it follows that quote S names T. I'm just repeating that very general principle okay. that we can go from identity to a referential claim, namely that the expression on the left of the identity names the thing uh, referred to on the right. So that's, that's just, I, I took that that principle is unproblematic yes. okay. in this con context. I see. I see, okay. Yeah. Well, I was, I was, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure because I was thinking that there might be, but I see, I see. This is not where the problem is going to kick in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I see. I, I had a follow-up question, if you, if you allow me, because how would you relate the theory you're out, outlining here with uh, the way formal self-reference works, the sort of Gödelian self-reference works? Cause can, can we sort of look at it? through the lenses of your theory, that kind of account. Yeah, have you, yeah, have you so tried? this is interesting. So this actually is how, the, how I start thinking about it. I, I wrote this paper with Andrew Bacon and, and we were um, uh, giving uh, a definition of, uh, one way of thinking of it, it uh, well, I'm thinking of a definition of a necessity operator, which has applications uh, to sentences that involve the necessity operator. And we had this formal definition, uh, and I couldn't see how to, un how to understand it as an informal definition. That is how I can actually think of this notion of necessity as being endowed with meaning. Um, so just um, uh, let me, let me um, raise the same problem in regard to Kripke's definition of truth. Uh, I mean, just take, take one of his fixed points, let's say for the cle strong cleany or what have you, and the minimal fixed point, okay. So he, he, has, he defines a, tru a truth predicate, okay. And the talk of Gödel numbering here is, I think, very confusing. So let's suppose the whole thing is done in 
something like Quine's proto-syntax, where we actually could talk directly about the syntax of the language. OK. Um, then um, you can think of, uh, and of course, a complication here is that um, this truth predicate uh, is gappy. OK, but that's sort of incidental to, to what I'm talking about here. So what, what Kripke has actually done is um, one thing you can think of as, as, as having done is to find a, a, a truth predicate. Well, that, that truth, now that truth predicate applies to sentences that involve the very thing, involve the truth predicate, call it T. <laughs> so those sentences involve T. Those sentences, insofar as they involve T, are uninterpreted. This is just like Jack. So that truth predicate that he's defined is true of these uninterpreted sentences. But I want it to be true of sentences that involve the very truth predicate that he's defined. That is the one that's been endowed with meaning. And his definition doesn't do that. OK. Now, what the theory will do is we'll say this. If Kripke can. The, the, OK, the, the different op levels on which you can operate. But this sort of minimal theory I was talking about, um, what the theory will actually tell you is there'll be a principle saying, if Kripke can do what he says, if Kripke, given that Kripke is given this perfectly good mathematical definition, we can convert it into a, a real definition. That is one in which um, uh, this predicate is actually true. Uh, of sentences involving that very truth predicate. That is the semanticized truth predicate. So the theory will tell you that. Uh, of course, you might want a, a, a justification of these underlying principles, but anyway. So that, um, that's what I was thinking. So we can now actually think, properly think, of the truth predicates having been endowed with me and it's applying to sentences that involve that very truth predicate. That was the problem. That was actually initially in the problem that I had. How, how, to be able to, how can we think of what Kripke is doing uh, in 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 this way, um, I, I, does does that help? Yeah, partly. Uh, I, except I, I was even wondering about the pre kripke sort of Gödelian, you know, way of achieving self-reference in a formal language, where you just assign uh, numbers to expressions, yeah, and then you decide that the interpretation of these numbers will be sorry the, of the numeral corresponding to these numbers will be a number. So, um, but I, yeah, I, I, the, eventually, if you have a fixed point uh, lemma, which tells you that a property is true of the good number of a sentence, if and only if that sentence, um, yeah, I was wondering whether the, on the one hand, we interpret a sentence, on the other hand, we we have uh, uh, the name of a number, and so I was wondering um, whether that that sort of uh, neat way of achieving self-reference can be uh, traced uh, through the steps of your construction. Um, look, when you say girdle, are, are you just talking about, for example, the incompleteness theorem, where we actually uh, seem to have this Yeah, yeah, I'm, to I'm talking of the diagonal lemma in order to construct the incompleteness theorems. You see what I mean? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, but... One big difference between what Kripke is doing and what Gödel is doing is that Kripke adds this predicate T to the language, uh, whereas G Gödel is already dealing with what you might regard as uh, uh, interpreted language. So the specific problem I have has to do with the fact that this, there's this uninterpreted predicate added to the language, which is given no meaning. It's not as if we already have not understand what it means. Okay. And then, then there's an attempt to, to define what it is. So that's very different from what's going on um, with Gödel. I guess you could have added the predicate provable to the language. This would be an odd thing to do, because Gödel's trying to prove incompleteness for this original language. So I'm not sure the cases are quite, uh, um, but the, but the, the difficulty is this, that, um, yeah, you can use a diagonal argument to achieve. Uh, I'm not even bothered about self-reference here. I'm just even bothered about reference. <laughs> uh, that is, uh, if you've added T to the language, 
and you have this girdle number, right, mm -hmm. for some sentence evolving T. Um, in effect, you're referring to an uninterpreted sentence. Uh, so um, you, you can't hide behind the girdle number. <laughs> oh, I'm talking about the number. <laughs> but you can't really hide behind the number because really what you want to be talking about is the is the, that sentence which which involves this uninterpreted T? That's that's the uh, right. Yeah, I see. So for me, whether um, it doesn't even matter whether it's self-reference. I mean, even even if uh, I guess even if you added T to the language and then restricted yourself in such a way that self-reference didn't arise, there would still be this problem. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So there, there is another question. Please come to the floor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Matteo Plebani. Uh, probably you already answered that, that question, but I just want to be to to clarify things for myself. So. Think about those cases in which apparently you achieve self-reference not by using a name, but by using a description, like the sentence written on the blackboard in room 75 is short. Yeah. And it turns out that that very sentence is the one written uh, on blackboard, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. in, in that case, everything is interpreted from the start and uh, everything is meaningful from the start. You're not adding anything to the language. So you should be fine with that. Uh, yeah, that's a great, great question. And actually, I haven't, I haven't really, oddly enough, I haven't really thought about that uh, uh, that case. Um, so um, the um, uh, so. Uh, The um, um, the, the, the position requires that there be a, a problem here, uh, and uh, problem may yet just be with the notion of sentence that you're um, you're using. Um, Because uh, um, sentences have to be interpreted, right? So there certainly is an uninterpreted sentence that you could be re referring to. Now, you're saying the sentence is meaningful, but um, if there's the word sentence, I, I, I'm, I said I haven't really thought about this, but um, the word sentence is being used in that very okay. uh, what, what, sentence. What, what, and, and the question is, how is it being used? If it's being used to refer to possibly uninterpreted uh, sentences, uh, then we can't, properly speaking, talk about them being true or false. Okay. So it, it has to, and I think that probably what will one might say is that um, either, either, either that's how it is, um, uh, or by sentence we mean uh, uh, interpreted sentence. But what, 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 uh, if I, what if I say the, the sequence of marks written on blackboard number 75 is short, or the expression written Black yeah, but the expression is. It, it, do you mean by there are two kinds of expression? There's uninterpreted expressions and expression and interpreted expressions. So, which 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 are you referring to? Well, I suppose that both are expressions. So, if I say expression, I mean let's say suppose that I say well, se it, sequence it, of marks. I mean, I mean that, that, there shouldn't be ambiguity. I mean, we ha want to be able to refer to one thing. So, are we okay. are we referring to the okay, uninterpreted okay. sequence? Yeah. Okay, I got. So even if you say sequence of marks, the same problem arises. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I, but I need to think more about this. It may not. It may be that. Um, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So because it, it might turn out that actually on the blackboard there are two, two, there are two things written on the blackboard. So that might be the problem. Oh. Oh no, that is, that is the view. In the, in the mean. This, is the, this is the view. There's a yeah, statue yeah, declared, yeah. So, so there's so, the uninterpreted and the interpreted. Yeah, so you cannot. So they're both, and and um, uh, I guess you should be clear which you mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, uh, and I guess the point would. I, I need to think more about this. The point would be that if it's the uninterpreted sentence you're referring to, then it's not strictly speaking true or false. If it's, if it's uh, and. Um, if you're talking about the interpreters, then you're presupposing that there is such a thing, and, and that's what's, what's now, in, now in question. Uh, but now, now some account needs to be given as to why, uh, uh, the, the, what the reason for thinking there isn't the yeah. interpreted sentence. Yeah, because in, in, yeah. In, any I, I, uh, in any case, the situation is different because the, the, the words that I'm using are, 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 are have a meaning, so when, when, when I write, uh, I, so it's, it's not that I'm introducing a new name in the language. The words that I'm using are so. May, may, I'm, oh, just, I'm just pointing they, out that is that is different from Kripke's case. Yeah, the, they, 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 yeah, they may have a meaning, but there's still a question as to whether yeah, you're yeah. referring to anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, the, it's only evident that you're referring to something if by sentence you mean uninterpreted sentence. Yeah, yeah, That's, yeah. So, so it wouldn't be doubted that the words have a meaning in either case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.